Well, good evening and uh, welcome to Bethel Live. My name's uh, John. I get to minister here at uh, Bethel and uh, at the moment we're in a series together thinking about this incredible uh, title that is given to the Holy Spirit. And of course, it's, it's more than a title that describes him. It describes a relationship into which we can enter. Uh, Jesus calls him very clearly the comforter the one who ministers the things of God uh, to the inner person, to the inner life of his disciples. And we're going to be continuing that series tonight. So we're going to turn together to John chapter 16, uh, and uh, Yohan has sent in the reading for tonight. I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith, for you will be expelled from the synagogues. And the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now, so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you for a while longer. But now I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the Advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I'll send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin, and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So Father God, as we begin, we thank you Lord that we do not study this text or this book. Uh, like any other book of history because Lord it, it contains the living word of God uh, Lord somehow you're able to speak through these words uh, through this story to the story that is me and to the living ongoing active story that you're doing in my life and so I just pray now for all of us God whether we've had a, a real tough season uh, or whether Father things are beginning to turn around uh, whether there are some great lessons that we've been learning or need to learn, uh, whether we're struggling and low, uh, whether we're feeling a bit more victorious and high. Lord, you've got something to say to each and every one of us, Lord, whether we feel like we're a real newbie disciple uh, or whether this is something that we've been walking in and growing in for many, many years. I pray tonight, Lord, that you'd minister to us out of your word uh, and, Father, direct the course of our story through what you're going to say tonight. Uh, Lord, we don't want to finish our time together the same as we began. Uh, that would be the wrong way to read your word. And so we pray, Father, that as we read it, uh, that you, by your spirit, the, the presence of the comforter here would read us uh, and that we would be changed in the encounter. And Lord Jesus, we pray these things tonight for your glory and for the sake of your work in us and through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. This may be a rather brave question to begin with tonight. I don't know, but I'm feeling brave. So here we go. Let's just go for it. Is anybody else feeling a bit sorry for Boris Johnson right now? But it's almost impossibly difficult uh, in this situation. He needs to have an ear for the scientists and learn from the research and, and, and all their recommendations and, and guidelines and suggestions. He needs to have an ear for the economist and keep an eye on how the business of the country is going, how people's livelihoods, not just lives, are, are struggling. He sadly also has to have an ear for the politics of the situation and how people may or may not react and what that may or may not mean. He needs to have an ear for the public and how they're feeling and uh, how, how they're responding, and not just to the crisis, but to the government's guidelines about it. He's got to have an ear for, for all of these things and then try to work out a way to navigate through that, knowing that not everyone will be happy. You, you cannot please all the people uh, all of the time. And then he's got to try to then persuade people that the way in which he's going to navigate all of these concerns, uh, all of these problems, all of these obstacles, uh, is the best way forward. And to try with his words to persuade people uh, to follow a, a, a roadmap, uh, a route out of this. And then 
after he's done that, he's got to look down at his phone where he will have a, a Twitter feed or a Facebook account or a news app uh, and read everybody's responses to his attempt to persuade them of the best way forward. I'm sure at times it feels like there is a big red rubber stamp that comes crashing down on the things that he said or the things that he's um, put forward that says failed to persuade. FTP, failed to persuade. I'm sure at times we, we felt like that. Maybe you've um, been in work and you've had a white hot passion to change something. You could see a, a better way that it could be done and you've gone rushing to the people that could implement uh, such a change or, or, or could um, instigate it. And there's just been a sense of rejection. You've bounced right off the, uh, the boardroom back to the drawing board. Failed to persuade. Didn't work. Maybe the issue wasn't in work. Maybe it was in your family and uh, you, you saw a way in which you could relate together, spend more quality time together, but others just weren't interested. Maybe for you, there is a sense of a, a, a burning vision in you. Uh, and it's not about sort of convenience or efficiency. It's about justice or compassion or hope or peace. But at the moment, every door you knock just seems to, to be closed to you and seems to bounce. You seem to bounce off it. And all you can read uh, in, it, in the kind of the inner vision over that, that vision, are the words failed to persuade. Sometimes it runs even deeper than that and the stakes are even higher. Sometimes you can share your faith or your story with somebody that doesn't share that faith or hasn't had that experience yet and you've built up to it and you've prepared for it. Maybe even you've, you've practiced it. And then comes the moment after you've, you've prayed it up and built it up in your mind and, and you pour your life, you pour your story, you pour out your hope in, for somebody. And then there's just that moment where you realize, I failed to persuade. Sometimes those moments can make us stand back and almost question God on it. God, why? why? I, I felt that was right. I felt that was what you wanted me to do. I thought I was, I thought I was hitting one for the for the team there. Where were you, uh, in in that moment when my tongue got tied, when my words got jumbled, when my confidence was shaken, uh, when I could see it was just bouncing off uh, a, a brick wall? Where were you? Sometimes we can uh, be forced to step even further back from that and look at the state of faith, uh, not just in a friend's life or family member's life, uh, but in our, our nation. And at times we can really have cause to ask the question, what on earth is the Holy Spirit doing right now? And tonight I just want to spend a few moments in this promise of Jesus who tells us exactly what right now the Holy Spirit is doing uh, on earth. When we're honest, we admit, don't we, that there's not just many things we wish we could do. There's many things we wish the Holy Spirit would do. And maybe it'll help us in our relationship with him, uh, in our living, in our praying, in our expecting, just to spend some time tonight exploring what Jesus promises the Comforter will do when he comes. So look with me at uh, chapter 16. I'm going to read from verse 7 down to verse 11. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because people do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, uh, one of the key roles that he will have is in persuading, in the work of inner persuading. Uh, and he says he's going to persuade the world, persuade people on, on three key topics. One is sin. Now that can sound like a real um, harsh thing. You know, the Holy Spirit is just walking around making everyone feel bad or making everyone feel more guilty. 
But there are times, aren't there, where we have to be persuaded of the bad news before we'll believe the good news. Uh, and the devil has worked really hard. The enemy is very clever in convincing people uh, that the, the sin in our lives isn't really an issue. You know, how many times have you heard people say the phrase, well, if it's not really hurting anyone, uh, if they're happy, let, let them carry on, L live and let live. Uh, but the truth is we can entertain ourselves a long way down the road to destruction. And the Holy Spirit's role is not to make people feel bad in and of itself, but is to convince people of the state they're in because there is a remedy and because there is a cure, because there simply is no need to live uh, without God in our lives and without that awareness of God. Jesus says, in regard to sin, because people do not believe in me, the truth is it's much easier to sin when we do not believe in God. And the Bible is very, very clear on this, that the greatest sin of all is unbelief. Maybe some of you have, have known this pain of being routinely ignored or neglected. That's recognized now as, as a form of abuse within families, uh, to be treated as if you are not there to be not valued, to be not recognized. It's a horrible experience. And Jesus says, the, the greatest sin of all is to not believe in me, to live in God's world as if God did not exist, uh, to live our whole lives without acknowledging him, without seeking him, without wanting him. The greatest sin of all. And so the Holy Spirit's work is to convince people, to persuade them of the bad news so that they can come to the full realization that this God is there. And then this relationship can begin uh, and not just begin, but, but flourish. He goes on to say that the Holy Spirit will persuade people about sin, but also about righteousness. See, the truth is we don't just need persuading about what's wrong. We also need persuading about what's right. The truth is we're all born, aren't we, into a culture, uh, into a context. And sometimes it's very easy to look at somebody else's culture and somebody else's context and to spot things uh, that we would easily identify as institutionally wrong about that setup. But we so rarely see it about ourselves. Sometimes it, it takes that clash of cultures. Sometimes it takes somebody else coming in to help us to see not just what is wrong, but also what is possible, uh, what, it's, what is right. And throughout history, the people we hold up as heroes are often those people who, who are just able to show us there is a better way, there's a more noble way, there's a higher way. And of course, of all the lives that have ever lived, uh, Jesus is the highest and the greatest and the best. He came to reveal the way of the father and in three short years of public ministry when he held no public office he didn't write a book he didn't marshal an army he didn't hold big conferences or uh, do any of the things that we'd expect him to in three short years all he did was to live the father's life among us to display and to demonstrate the kingdom and that in and of itself, before we even get to the cross and resurrection, has revolutionized uh, the entire world and still is, even today, we're still really just catching up with life as Jesus did it. But of course now, uh, Jesus says, I have gone to the Father, and so it's the Holy Spirit's role to persuade the world of righteousness, of what is right. Another way to understand this verse, I love the way the New Living Translation puts it, uh, is to uh, persuade the world that righteousness is available because I have gone to the Father. You know, that's such a lovely phrase, I've gone to the Father. And it trips off the tongue so often. But of course, for Jesus to go to the Father, he was going to have to go through Calvary. And it is there on the cross where Jesus exchanges his perfect righteousness, his perfect right record, his perfect uh, relationship with God. He exchanges it for our dirty record, our faulty record, uh, our record of wrongfulness. And the Holy Spirit wants the world to know that Jesus' righteousness is now available because he has gone to the Father. And the Holy Spirit is working to try and persuade people of that. And then finally, in this verse, we read this in verse 11. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. 
sometimes when you're queuing up in a shop, you can see uh, behind the cashier a whole bunch of stuff that you have to be at a certain age to buy. Uh, a lot of them are, are cigarettes. And if you study those cigarette packets carefully, uh, there's a little phrase that the government has been has insisted, or phrases that the government insists are printed on every single packet of cigarettes that is sold that, that, that just tell people smoking is bad for you, smoking kills, smoking is, it is detrimental to your health. They're not doing that to make people who smoke feel worse about themselves they're doing it out of out of love if you continue to do this there will be consequences maybe even dire com consequences for you and one of the holy spirit's role is, is to persuade people of judgment that if we live in our wrongfulness mm -hmm. and if we live apart from god uh, that that's a choice that is available to us as gk chesterton once famously put it hell is god's greatest compliment to human freedom if you really want to live without god you you can choose to do that he will not enforce anybody to follow him to serve him or to love him uh, worship is is always a choice as far as god's concerned but we need to be persuaded that there is a judgment that is coming and that the prince of this world which is one of jesus's ways of talking about the enemy of our souls the devil now stands condemned the person that is condemned at the cross is not just jesus as he takes the price for all of our sin and none of his own but he's condemning sin itself. He's condemning the devil. And now because of the cross and through the power of the resurrection, the evil one is he, he himself is the one who now stands condemned. So where does that leave us? I love the words of Billy Graham, as he once famously uh, described his ministry in this way. It's God's job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's my job to love. Huge thanks to everybody for all their encouragement for the uh, different types of ministry that we're exploring at the moment as we're trying to learn a new kind of type of, of media ministry to nourish and sustain us and uh, to keep our, our mission alive uh, during this season. Now, who knows how long it will take and it's it's been a steep learning curve. And one of the things that we've had to get used to uh, is that you have to build in time to prep for things in, in a different way. And so, for example, I, I spend a lot of time sometimes waiting for something to a video to what's called render, which is when the computer puts it all together in the order that you told it to and adds whatever music and images and other video that you want to put into it. Uh, and then to wait for that to be uploaded and then, then processed. And sometimes you find yourself helplessly staring at this progress bar that you're just trying to will and uh, somehow, you know, just, just by staring at it, force it to go faster. But of course, it never does. And when it comes to serving the purposes of Jesus, Jesus is very clear. We, we do not do it alone. We do not have to live this life alone. The, the comforter is not just with us. He's in us to help us live this life. But there are times when we've tried to share something, when then you have to walk away and allow the Holy Spirit time to push that progress on, unseen in someone else's life. And maybe you'll never be the one to know it. Maybe you'll never be the one to see it but the Holy Spirit is at work. And we know this, don't we? Because there was a time in our lives when that progress bar within us slipped past somehow uh, just exploring faith to experiencing faith, from knowing about God uh, to knowing God and meeting him. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I know at times it can be frustrating, I know at times we'd love to push the progress bar faster in other people's lives, but we need to learn to leave the results to God. He knows what he's doing. It's his job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. And it's our job to love. So let's just take a moment tonight to think about where we are and what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in this situation. And let's just pray for the work of the Holy Spirit through us and in the lives of others. Let's pray. 
And it might be right now that uh, you're thinking already of a conversation or conversations that you've had with a person or with people uh, that just seemed to stop somewhere, didn't seem to go anywhere, and you feel like you failed to persuade them. Maybe you've felt down about that, or maybe you've beaten yourself up about that. So Holy Spirit, I, I just pray right now that you'd minister your comfort to us. That there are things that we do, but then there's the work that only you can do. Help us, Lord, we pray to do what we can do. And then to prayerfully, faithfully expect your results. Father, we pray in this season for all those people who are seeking faith, who are asking big questions, who are looking to learn how to pray, are looking for safe places for that faith to blossom and flourish. And Father, we pray for the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And we pray against the evil one, the prince of this world, the one who stands condemned and yet from that position is accusing others and condemning others. And I wanted to bind others up into lives of guilt and shame and confusion and fear or apathy and rejection. We pray against his work, Father. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would lead people, Father, not just to the bad news, but from there, from the good to the good news, Lord, to the reality that there is another way, that there's another hope, that there's another righteousness, that there's another life, that there is a Savior who is alive and well. And help us, we pray, Father, in, in this situation. It's so easy, Lord, to be drawn to the negative, uh, to the hard, to the despairing, uh, just, Father, the longer this goes on, we, we confess, Father, it, it, it is wearisome, Lord, it, it's heavy. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us, Lord, to navigate towards what is right, Lord, to see your righteousness, and then to live like you, Jesus, in this world, in this season. And, Lord Jesus, we pray that tonight for your glory, as we ask it in your name. Amen.